Judith Butler was born in 1956 to a Jewish family in Cleveland. They identify as a non-binary lesbian and have a wife and a child. After studying philosophy at Yale, they went on to become one of the most famous and influential feminist and queer theorists in the world. We act as if that being of a man or that being of a woman is actually an internal reality or something that's simply true about us, a fact about us. Actually, it's a phenomenon that's being produced all the time and reproduced all the time. In 2020, The New Yorker described them as an international celebrity academic. Throughout their career, Dr. Butler has taught at a number of universities, including John Hopkins and UC Berkeley. Through their huge body of work, Butler is perhaps most well known for their idea of gender as a performance. This idea and those related to it have garnered widespread praise and critique alike. Pope Benedict XVI even opposed their ideas publicly, and at one point Butler was characterized as the Antichrist due to their position as a symbol for queer rights. Butler also won the 1998 Philosophy and Literature Bad Writing Competition first prize. A major ongoing critique of their work seems to be that it is too pretentious, elusive, and elitist. Personally, I didn't find gender is burning to be any more pretentious, elusive, or elitist than the majority of the other theory we read, but I also think that it is important for activists' research to be accessible and digestible, even for populations who aren't used to reading complicated pieces. Another critique of Butler's work is that their ideas are reductive to the concept of gender by discussing it as a discourse rather than a reality. Judith Butler has also used their platform to be vocal on other issues and contemporary topics like Black Lives Matter and coronavirus. Before we get into their 1993 article, Gender is Burning, Questions of Appropriation and Subversion, I want to also give a little bit of background on Paris is Burning, since Butler seems to assume that readers are already familiar with it. Paris is Burning, directed by Jenny Livingston in the 1980s and released in 1990, centers around the drag ball scene in New York in the late and mid 80s. Although the events of the documentary are now over 30 years in the past, they serve as a good articulation of the street roots of the glam we see today on shows like RuPaul's Drag Race. In Paris is Burning, we see drag as competition, social, and career motivated, and how it interacts with and critiques social constructs like gender, sex, race, and class. To win competitions and survive the rest of the world, the queens must pass, whether that be as women, straight, white, or upper class. Whether they are drag queens, which are usually gay men impersonating women, or transgender women, it is vital that they pass. Passing means that they can move throughout the world as women, as straight men, as white, as rich, or as some combination of the five without being recognized as men, transgender, gay, not white, or poor. If they are recognized as transgender or gay, they are in real danger. In the film, this is recognized by the murder of Venus Extravaganza, who was found strangled and hidden under a hotel bed, and the foreshadowing story she told of a time when she was recognized as transgender while working as an escort. I was with a guy and he was playing with my titties till he touched me down there. He felt it and he seen it and he like totally flipped out. He said, you fucking faggot, you're a freak, you're a victim of AIDS and you're trying to give me AIDS, what are you crazy, you're a homo, I should kill you. You know, stuff like that. And like I was really terrified. Paris is Burning reveals the intricacies of gender's performative nature. If gender wasn't performative, how would men be able to depict women so convincingly? How would somebody assigned male at birth be able to actualize themselves as female later? The film shows cis men and women, drag queens and transgender women, passing both with and without gender-affirming surgery alike. This range of genders solidifies Butler's foundational argument that gender is performative and begins to show how manipulations of the concept can be acts of resistance.
Gender is Burning, Questions of Appropriation and Subversion, Judith Butler's 1993 article. They use Paris is Burning as a case study of a sort of civil disobedience of ideology. Although they never use the term civil disobedience, I think that it's a good way to explain Butler's concept of range of disobedience to question the legitimacy of boundaries. Civil disobedience is a peaceful form of protest where one breaks certain laws, often for a greater good or to call the laws themselves into question. For example, if you chain yourself to a tree to save it from being cut down, you might be breaking a curfew of the park if it closes at a certain time. Rosa Parks refusing to move to the back of the bus is also a great example. She refused to follow the rule in order to call its legitimacy into question. In the case of gender is burning, Butler is discussing resistance to the ideology of binary gender rather than resistance to an actual law. But aren't rigid ideologies more or less social laws? If they are, is drag a form of civil disobedience? On page 125, Butler calls into question whether parodying gender norms is enough to displace them. One way drag might do this is by exposing the anxiety of a potential homosexual consequence that heterosexual performativity can never overcome. As was discussed by Joan Scott in The Evidence of Experience, heterosexuality is defined by homosexuality as its outer limit. Oftentimes, however, this straight anxiety seems to be to the detriment of queer individuals and communities. In the case of Venus Extravaganza, self-expression, which happened to fall into the category of this ideological civil disobedience, had the ultimate cost. Butler describes this hierarchy where women like Venus are disposable transgressors as the social map of power. This is on page 131. Venus's fate in the discussion of the social map of power reminds me of the altogether two common crimes committed against trans women of color. According to HRC, 2021 has already seen at least 12 transgender or gender non-conforming people fatally shot or killed by other violent means. We say at least because too often these stories go unreported or misreported. In previous years, the majority of these people were Black and Latinx transgender women. In the summer of 2020, six Black trans women were found dead over the span of nine days. Is this disobedience even making a difference on a cultural scale? Or must the disobedient pass to the degree that their disobedience isn't even visible anymore, rendering it useless in terms of social change? Is it even fair to discuss identities in the context of theoretical civil disobedience? I suppose that this could be part of the critique of Butler. They discuss identities with very real consequences in a context that suggests that they are, at least to some degree, discursive choices of resistance. Performances of gender and sexuality may push boundaries, calling the legitimacy into action, but they aren't necessarily choices of rebellion so much as self-actualization. Butler also draws connections to drag and resistance of social roles relating to race and class in addition to gender and sexuality, starting at the bottom of page 128. For example, the drag queens try to appear and act white and affluent as possible in competition categories. Butler also relates the issues at hand more explicitly to bell hooks and other concepts we've discussed in class, like fetishization. They also connect them to Willa Cather, but I'm not familiar with her work. Overall, there are a lot of layers to Butler's discussion of gender and sexuality as performance as it relates to what I've been calling civil disobedience of theory, so I can't hope to unravel them all here. This maze of ideas, meaning, and implication may be part of Butler's point. At the very least, they recognize it. On page 140, they close with reference to the floundering and unraveling of the symbolic on its own impossible demands. Does this mean that these social laws are fighting a losing battle? Or that those acting in resistance to them are? In the context of the other readings this week, this piece calls into question social structures as opposed to physical structures and established institutions. While Foucault talks about military camps and prisons as total institutions, Butler indicates the potentially oppressive reality of society as a whole. Williams's use of hegemony may be closer to Butler's discussion, but how does it differ? How can we as anthropologists follow the lead of Delmos Jones and make sure we do not contribute to these sorts of oppression? See you in class.
In the case of gender is burning, Butler is disgusting. <laughs> Butler isn't disgusting, I take it back.